Well, let's get in tonight. We're going to hop right on in here because we've got a lot to cover. <clears throat> uh, we'll get our, let's go ahead and get to the maps, um, please. And, um, you know, if you haven't been with us, I encourage you to go back and watch our Wednesday nights and this past Sunday afternoon. Um, if you weren't here Sunday afternoon for the, afternoon, the Super time, Bowl Super Time service, which was a waste. The Dud Bowl. The only good thing out of the entire Super Bowl was the Jack Bauer commercials, that Jack is back. Okay? <laughs> yeah, Jack is back. Hallelujah. Um, but let, let's go ahead here. And I don't have my little thing. But uh, again, Paul is on his second missionary journey. <clears throat> we've, covered, we've covered through the book of Acts. And what, you're wondering why we're not in the book of Acts reading and moving. Because we're covering his first two letters. And we're doing all this in chronological order. So he's still hung up at Corinth. All right? Because that's where he's writing these letters from. So Paul left uh, Antioch. And uh, this is around 49 to 52 AD. We, some of these things are just not clear because, you know, if you go to one scholar, they say it happened in 50. They one another said it happened in 51. Uh, the journeys took two years. The journeys took a year and a half. Uh, some of these things are just hard to really nail down. Um, historically and be precise It'd be like 2,000 years from now saying that pastor ed preached a sermon in greensboro and somebody says no he preached over winston you know and, and 2,000 years from now we're talking about 20 miles difference who cares okay or we're talking about six months apart he preached in 2010 no he preached in 2011 in the year 4,013 who cares we're close all right so Paul left Antioch on his second mission trip. This is the Green Line. Went through Tarsus, Derby, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Uh, went up, remember, he was forbidden by the Holy Ghost to go down into um, to, um, Asia, which is down here in this, this area called where Ephesus and the city Antioch is. That was Asia at that time. And then he wanted to go into Bithynia, which is up at the coast of the Black Sea. What, he didn't get to go there. So he heard a man in Macedonia. This is this area up here. Um, you see the scale come down, that, that, that italicized word is Macedonia. Um, and so he came over, he said, come over to us. He went over there to Naples, to Philippi. Remember in Philippi, uh, they got thrown in jail and beat. All right. And at midnight they prayed, sang praises to God. Okay. And uh, so they, they left from there and went to Amphipolis and then uh, Apollonia and then over into Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, he starts a church there. Okay, they have, a, they have a church there, and we've read all this. That's why I say, go back and listen to all this. All this background information is very good. It helps you got to get an idea of where it's going on. It starts, it says, he has a young baby church there, but, you know, they, get, they get kind of run out of Thessalonica because the Jews get upset. The Gentiles are getting preached to. And so they, they leave. They go over to Berea. They're over there preaching to Berea, and the, and the same bunch leaves uh, Thessalonica and runs over to Berea, and, and, they leave, and they, so they send Paul away. And so Paul comes down from Berea, and he comes down into Athens. And then not long after he's in Athens, Timothy and Silas join him there. Okay? And, uh, and after a season, Paul wants to know what's going on with the, with the Thessalonians really bad. So he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. He then, in some, somewhere in this period of time, moves over to Corneth. Now, there, you'll have people who say that Paul wrote the letters in, in Athens. Others say Corneth. So we're just going with the Corneth theory. All right? You know, they're not that far apart. It's like saying, did you write it in Kerner's Village or did you write it in High Point? Okay? It just depends on who, who, who's, who they're studying behind and, you know, whose opinion it was. But anyway, we, 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 we're going from the point that he wrote, got to Corneth, spent 18 months in Corneth. And while there, um, he has a long, uh, Timothy shows up, brings him a report of the church of Thessalonica. And then Paul writes about, Somewhere between three and six months after he left Thessalonica, he writes his first, the first letter Paul wrote ever that we have record of. Okay? Writes it to the church of Thessalonica. So he sends, back, he sends a letter back to Thessalonica um, inquiring of things of them. I mean, actually, well, Timothy goes there. And so, so here, here's the thing. There could be eternal evidence that there was a letter prior to that, maybe because he inquired of their thing and he had gotten back. We just don't know for sure. What we do know is we only have record of two, so we're going to stay with two. All right? Writes to this young church. I mean, since Timothy back, Timothy comes back, and we covered First Thessalonians on Sunday afternoon. So you need to go back and listen to that because I can't recover all that information again. It's just, it just took me the entire hour and fifteen minutes or so, going pretty hard to get through it. Some of these letters we're not going to get through in a service. 
Some of them are not going to get through in a month. Probably. You get to Romans, you get to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, are really long letters. Um, they, they may t- it could take some time to get through them, okay? But after the 1st Thessalonians, about three months later, Paul writes another letter to the church at Thessalonica. Still at Corneth, and this is where we are. So after we finish this letter, we're going to move on. We'll go back to the book of Acts, find out where Paul went from there, and we'll go from there, okay? Um, if, we, if somebody doesn't mind, go ahead and go ahead and drop these heats back, you know, the one in the hallway and this one here, because it's starting to really build up up here. So open your Bibles if you go to 2 Thessalonians. This is, a, this is a follow-up letter after the first letter to the church of Thessalonica. It is written in the, the time frame. You go ahead to the outline of Thessalonica, 2 uh, sec, Thessalonians. Um, was somewhere around 52 A.D., like, as I said, about two to three months or so uh, after the first letter that Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, he writes this letter. And so we're going <clears> to <throat> we'll go through this. first chapter is, is, is very typical Pauline and, and, and approach. And uh, he'll, he'll thank God for their, their growth, encourage them in their pers- because of the persecution they're going through, and he prays a blessing on them. So let's go ahead and get into this first chapter. And then we'll, it's only three chapters long. It says, Paul and Silvanius and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity or love of every one of you aboundeth uh, toward, each, toward each other aboundeth. Now, uh, oftentimes, Paul will start out a letter talking about the grace of God being on him, talking about, you know, how that he hears good things about him. You know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Even the church at Corneth, remember, that was a really very corrective letters to the church at Corneth. And Paul wrote to them and said, you come behind in no gift. I mean, he just, you know, he always kind of started out with, you know, you guys are great. I love you. You know, you're, you're a blessing. Hallelujah. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, if you'll remember when we were talking about Sunday about the, the church at Thessalonica, it taught, Paul wrote to them and talked about how they were enduring the same similar persecutions that the, those churches in Judea had been going through. Remember that? And so Paul's recommending them um, on their faith. If you want to go ahead and get to the, the slide that has the outline of 2 Thessalonians on it. Uh, it's, it's probably the last slide. There we oh, well, we'll get, just go. I think it's the last slide. And so here he gives, he, he comes back to them and says, we glory in the churches, your patience. And he says, you know, uh, honoring them for their patience and faith. Uh, Second Thessalonians. Um, there we go. There we go. Can't read it, can you? Hallelujah. I got I to gotta take that in consideration when I start putting these slides out. If we had a 70-foot screen, I guess it would show up pretty good. <clears throat> um, this will be on the internet. Dr. Bill could pop it and, and replace the old one. Um, so we ourselves glory in you in, in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, I don't know where we got the idea. But about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, the, the, the Word of Faith bunch, and that's, we thought, man, if you, just, if you just believe God, you would never have any trouble. Everything, and see, Dad Hagen would come out and say, you know, some folks think they're going to go through life on flowery beds of ease, you know. And, and, and people get upset because, you know, he, he's, not, he's talking unbelief almost. It's not, you know, you're going to endure temptation. You know, you can endure persecutions. You have to endure persecution. You have to endure temptation. You have to overcome temptation. Okay? Um, God, t- he says here, you have faith and patience in the middle of your persecutions and temptations. They're enduring them. And they're enduring them well, apparently. And then he says in the next verse, um, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, which you also suffer, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, when we read the Bible, sometimes these little things we come up with just get knocked in the head. We get this idea if we just love people, everything's going to be hunky-dory, shouldn't ever talk about the judgment of God. Paul says these people that trouble you, God's going to judge them. We need to read our Bibles. He said it's a righteous thing with God 
to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. See, we, we misunderstand things because we don't study the Bible fully. Again, the difference between an, an expository or exegetical study of Scripture versus a systematic theology study. Um, I, I believe, in th I believe we, that systematic theology is a good way to study the Bible if you also include an expositorial or ex, uh, exegetical style of study along with it so that you don't get out of balance. <coughs> Studying everything in context, the whole, then if you go back and you study faith with the whole as a, as a, as a parameter, what is that? Okay. Hey, maybe, maybe the guy's next door on our roof. I don't know. Hallelujah. And so it, well, sometimes we'll come in and we'll talk about love. People, people who just study love. Oh, he's a love preacher. Well, now, they call Dad Hagen a faith preacher, but I'm going to tell you something. You go back and study his teachings and stuff. He, faith was the thrust of his ministry. He didn't just teach faith. And he always brought balance when he taught faith. There are people who get into certain subjects, and they'll just get out of balance with it and just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it to extremes where it no longer is, is, is scripturally sound. Okay, and so we get people saying things like, oh, well, we should never talk, you know, we should never uh, think about God's judgment because God doesn't judge God's love. Well, right here it says, see, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that uh, trouble you. See, it was a righteous thing. Everybody say, righteous. righteous. <laughs> say, I'm a righteous brother. All right, no. <laughs> and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Don't talk about hell. Don't talk about judgment. People, there's, we got to find the balance. We really do have to find the balance between sharing the gospel in love and the, and listen, I, I shouldn't say sharing the gospel in love, sharing the whole gospel in love. Because it's love to warn people there's an imminent destruction if you don't repent and turn and come to God. Hello? We have to be more aware that God, God is a God of mercy and God is a God of, of grace, <clears throat> but there is also a, the God of judgment that people are going to have to deal with. And let me tell you something, nobody wants to deal with the judgment that comes on those who have rejected his, his, his sacrifice and his offering uh, to redeem them. Because the, the justice demanded in that judgment is not going to be pleasant. And it says that Jesus will come with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. Now, how many, how many times we hear people preaching on love, they talk about that? God just loves people. We should just talk about the love of God. Well, you know, some people need a wake up call. But if you don't get right with God, Jesus is coming in fiery flames. And you don't want to meet up with that. Hello? The Apostle Paul did on the Damascus Road, and the first words out of his mouth were, Who art thou, Lord? All right. When's that going to happen? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all good, the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, Paul says this over several times, this kind of phraseology, that you will be counted worthy. Well, how do we get counted worthy? We walk, we, we listen, we walk in a belief. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We walk in accordance with his word. Doesn't mean if you mess up, you're going to be unworthy. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? But that should be the design and the desire of the believer to pursue living a lifestyle that pleases and honors God walking worthy of the calling you're called to. Yeah. Amen? Doesn't mean that you've got to do it in your flesh, but there should be that pursuit. It shouldn't. See, here, here's where we get into trouble. 
Here Paul writes this and says he's praying that God will count them worthy. Then you come in 2,000 years later, you've got people saying, it don't matter what you do, you're under grace, you're going to heaven. And what we end up with is people beginning to lie down and say, it doesn't matter. When it does matter, your heart matters. It's a, it, it is a heart matter. Your heart matters. How you approach God, you know, how you approach the grace of God matters. Amen? I mean, even Paul rhetorically said in one place, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay? And so if we come away from something with a, with a mindset that how I live and what I do is irrelevant to my walk with the Lord, it's the wrong way to come away. You should come out of the presence of God going, I want to be more like him. I want to get closer to him. You know, that's there. You can't get any closer. Draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto thee, says the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That is in the New Testament. Yeah. You can get closer to God. In your relation, in your fellowship with him, in your, your walk with him. Okay. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, Paul, let's go ahead. We'll get into chapter two now. So Paul's opened this up and, and, and listen, this is kind of a follow-up letter. So it's not quite his normal letter if he was just writing to the church one letter. He's writing a follow-up letter to the Thessalonica. He's already written one. Go back and look at that. Well, we, we covered that on Sunday. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of, the Lord, of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, listen, for except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let's stop. There's too many pastors who no longer carry the weight and the burden of responsibility to make people aware there's a day coming as a thief in the night. And here's the term. And the falling away shall come first. That falling away is a pasta. A pasta. I think it's, it's pasta in the Greek. And it means apostate. There's, that means to turn from, to turn away. We should be guarding our hearts against opening up things in our life that make it okay to do things and to live in ways that aren't honorable to God. Why? Because the pressure is coming on the earth. See, um, now it's all about us. It's all about people. It really is all about people and not about God. It's about what makes them comfortable. We preach sermons for comfortability. We don't preach sermons to challenge a lot. I'm, just, I'm saying the majority of the church. Uh, a, a pastor friend of mine, uh, a Baptist pastor uh, here, in, here in Greensboro, just wrote, wrote a little Facebook quote the other day talking about how that the church is asleep. We've become lethargic. The world's going to hell and we're asleep at the wheel. We're, we're, wanting, we're wanting it made easy for us. And Paul's writing to the church, and he says here, and starting out chapter 2, he says, we beseech you. That's, the word beseech means to beg, to plead. Brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that ye, this is a young church. He just left there uh, probably seven, eight months ago at the most, that you not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of the Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. By any means, for that day shall not come except there will come, come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. There's going to be a falling away of the church. There are going to be people who, who claim and walk with Jesus Christ, be filled with the Spirit, they are going to turn from God. And it's not going to be a few, there's going to be a falling away. Bible even says in one place that the days weren't short and the very elect would be right. deceived. There's stuff that's going to be going on. We have to be panting after God as the deer panteth after the water. And I'm not talking about looking for ins and outs of how we can live as close to the world and get away with it. 
I'm talking about how we can live sold out to Jesus Christ. Amen. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume. Now, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, he's talking about when the Lord comes back, he's going to destroy him. Even him whose coming is, unless he's talking about the Antichrist, his coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And then that perish because they received not the love of the truth and they might, that they might be saved. Now, he goes on and says, uh, we'll get here. Now think about this now. He's coming with strong deceivableness. He's coming with signs and powers and lying wonders. People, well, a number of years ago, we had this, this, this person running around the church, ran around our circles. They would get oil and blood on the palms of their hands and feathers would fall from them. They'd say, feathers, feathers from heaven. And I know major ministries that I, I still respect. They got caught up in it and promoted this person. And then somebody that had the equipment to do it just didn't feel right about it. Went in, snuck into a meeting with a camera, high-speed high camera, so they could, they filmed it, went back and slowed it down and, and, and proved it. See, and of course, it, it just, everybody had to back off of it because they, they went in and said, all the stuff was stuffed up her sleeves and stuff and she, was, she had kind of got like sleight of hand where she was able to get this stuff out and not be, in, in the moment people couldn't see it but on a, on a camera that they filmed in high speed and then slowed it down and started doing sec, you know uh, um, frames per, per yeah, thank you hitting you know real the frames proved that she was a fraud it wasn't that long ago I had the whole gold dust thing remember that gold dust thing you know, people up in the Bible, there'll be gold dust in it. And everybody would give huge offerings. Why do you give huge offerings when there's gold dust in everybody's Bible? It wasn't everybody. You know, they, they, they had enough, uh, whatever, they could just take their, and, and they, somehow now they were flipping out, and it was hitting landing on people's Bibles, and they were, go, I got gold dust. And then everybody just put huge offerings in. The person died, by the way. People just throwing money in there. You don't need to take up an offering if you got gold dust. Let's be real. Oh, we got a miracle. Let's take up an offering. Why don't you just bring the gold dust back up? Vacuum it up and go, go weigh it out and sell it. Come on. So let me say this. He says he's coming after Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist is coming. But remember this. The Bible already tells us the spirit of Antichrist is in the earth. And Satan, we, we can't be signed. Jesus said that even an adulterous generation follows after signs. Now, I love the charismatic Pentecostal word of faith group, but I'll tell you what, we've been some of the dumbest people in the world when it comes to signs and wonders. We'll follow a sign in a heartbeat. We've just been that way. And, and honestly, a lot of people have, have used that. And spiritual charlatans have used that and come in and done things with those things and just rape the body of Christ. And we all sit around and go, it's just like the woman with the oil and the blood, supposedly in the feathers. Put on major ministry sta ministerial stages with television all over the place. What happens when you get on their, on their program? Everybody in the world wants you. We have to be aware of the, of the Spirit, particularly as we're getting closer to the end of things. And the clock, the, the, the time of, of, of the age is ticking towards midnight, as it were. We have to be more aware that there's going to be more pressure coming from the kingdom of darkness than ever before. And so we need to be vigilant. Remember, he wrote to, the church, er, he wrote to this church at Thessalonica in his first letter. He said we need to be sober. Amen? And, and guess what? That does mean what it says. I, I, I was, um, I had my um, Esword Bible up. You know, it has a little strong numbers. You can click on it right there. Did you know the word sober in First Thessalonians means ab abstain from wine? That's what it means. Stay sober. Stay sober, say abstain from wine. 
So you could just he could put there that you you abstain from wine. You don't be inebriated, and, and, and don't you know don't be caught up in stuff. Don't get caught up in the flesh. Don't get caught up in the world. Get caught up in the glory. Get caught up in Jesus Christ. You know, I mean. <coughs> For this cause, verse 11, God shall give them over to strong delusion that, believe not, that, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, who had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this is a pretty strong letter from Paul. I mean, he's, he's not missing words here about the, the end result of those who reject Jesus Christ. That's why I said we need to be aware when we start presenting truth if you present truth in an unbalanced manner, it can actually become, um, I don't want to say untruth, deception, thank you. I was looking, was looking for a word other than non-truth. You can preach a truth to the extent that it becomes deceptive, it becomes, a, it becomes erroneous. Okay? I have what I say. Well, no, you can't. The Bible says, what did Jesus say? He said, if you believe in your heart, you know, he said, this is the faith of God. Well, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So your faith, if it's coming from the word of God, is not going to be used to steal somebody else's wife. That's not faith. I didn't have what I say. I believe I receive her. Well, you can't receive her. She's married. So I called one day and told me that they, you know, the, the, the Lord has shown that they're going to marry somebody. Yeah, and you come to find out after about a 40-minute about conversation that somebody was already married. The Lord didn't show you that. You know, you take your pep to Bismol next time before you go to sleep. So you don't have pizza dreams. Amen. All right. He says, so they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he calls you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, therefore, because God calls you that way, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hold, hold, we told you how to live. We told you what to do. Now hold fast to those things. Don't waver. Don't, don't be so quick to run off after something new that abdicates you of any responsibility of how you live. It's not biblical. Matter of fact, Paul's writing to remind them how he told them to live. This is twice. He did it in the first letter, and he did it in this letter. <coughs> Remember when we were on 1 Thessalonians, he said this. He said, uh, you know, you know the commandments that I gave you, how you ought to walk and how, and how to live. And he says, and this is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Remember that? He started the fourth chapter. He's reminded them. He gave them commandments on how to live. He even comes right back over here and tells them to stand fast and hold the traditions which you have from him, whether he came from a word or came from an epistle he wrote to them. Hold fast to them. Why? Keep, you know, remember he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said that every man should learn how to, to possess his vessel in honor. We're to live honorably, amen, before the Lord, okay? Well, that does away with a lot of junk. If you're living honorably before the Lord, you're not living in a place where Jude said that, that people snuck in and turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, which you can also translate licentiousness, which are all not good words, okay? It, if you just want to be, you know, kind of get just hardcore carnal, Okay? Here he says, you know, hold fast the things we've already told you. That we gave you. There already become traditions in the church. Seven months later, there are already a tradition. All right? Hold fast to those. All right? And you've been taught them. So Paul obviously said things in the church about how you're supposed to live. He commended them for their faith. He taught them about faith. He taught them how to walk in love. And he also taught them how you're supposed to live. Amen. 
And so then he comes back here and says, you know, now the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope, a good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from an unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and shall keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the thing. We have confidence that you both do and will do the things which we command you. I just love when people say there's no commandments in the Bible. Really? Paul said, you know, I do the things, but the things, you will do the things we command. In other words, you're doing th some things, and there's some things we're probably going to tell you later that you're going to need to do, and you're going to have to command, you have to obey those commands. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, and to the patient waiting for, well, wait a second now. And, in other words, some people say, well, the only commandment is the commandment of love, and that's just not true. You're, you're, because Paul says in places that we left you with commandments. We told you how to do this and we had to do that. John says this is, this is his commandment that we love one another. He didn't say it's the only commandment of God ever written. John was, you know, that's where we get into trouble. We, we take something and we build a narrative around it and, and, and then we just exclude anything else because it doesn't fit the narrative. Now, we know this in politics. We have it happen all the time in politics. We don't want to use the, we don't want to look like, we're, you know, certain political parties don't want to look like we're not winning the war on terror. So the Fort Hood shooting where the, the guy was a Muslim and went out and killed people because he was a Muslim and wanted to do harm to America was called a workplace violence incident. It was terrorism. But still you change the mantra. You know, n newspapers won't allow them to say anymore that it's the war on terror. It's some kind of, you know, uh, world, act, world police act. They come up with some other terminology. Can't use terrorist. Why? They have a narrative. And when you create a narrative, and, you, and that's, that's what you're determined to sell that narrative. So we see it in politics all the time. You exclude every, everything else to support the narrative. Any... Uh, any evidence, exculpatory evidence that would contradict it is left out. Why? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. We're trying to create a narrative. Now, let's face it. We've had presidents that they, they decide the narrative that they were stupid. Yeah. Not, never mind that they had a higher GPA than the person that they're comparing them to and calling him brilliant at the same university. Okay, there's one point, a point, there's a point higher, but still higher. Okay, but they created, he, he was stupid. The narrative came out that he was stupid, and everything they said went that way. So when you create a narrative, and then you support the narrative, and not looking, and, then say, when you're, and you're, your goal is to force that narrative into the psyche of everybody and make it truth, you will not properly explains everything else. You'll just you'll stay with that. We do that with Scripture. We have ministers that do that because they have a narrative that makes them money, that's popular, gets them indoors, I mean, sells their books, and so they, they exclude all the other things that the Bible has that would contradict or bring a balance to what they're saying. We can't do that. Amen? I said amen. Hallelujah. So here Paul says, because we got something to say, the only commandment is the commandment of love. Uh, really, verse 6, look here. Well, We've got to read verse 5, I'm sorry. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, into patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, not after the, tradi not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Wow. Withdraw yourself from everyone who walketh disorderly. Okay. You get people come up and say, it's wrong to judge. They'll take Matthew 7, 1, 
And that's, that's, and that's, this is all over the place now. And let me say something. Matthew 7, 1 is, can be used as a trump card to any critique of your actions. Judge not, lest you be judged. Read that whole thing in context. It's talking about unrighteous judgment or hypocritical judgment. And it also says if you get the beam out of yours, then you can see clearly how to get the stick out of your brother's. So that's, that's how we know it's hypocritical. In other words, do it, thou that judgest another, do it thou the same. Well, if you're doing it yourself, you can't judge your brother for it. But if you straighten yourself up, then you can see clearly how to help him. See, we get, we get, there's all kinds of places where Jesus said, you know, Paul wrote and said, my judgment is just, and if I judge, it's righteous. Judge righteous judgment. You go, we don't have time to get, I'm not getting, I want to get too far into that. But here, if a brother walketh disorderly, not after the traditions we commanded you, that means you've got to do some judgment or scrutiny, or critique of what's going on. Matthew 7, 1 does not mean you have to sit around and go, I can't judge that, I'm, I'm, I can't say a thing about it, because that's judgmental. You haven't thoroughly studied your Bible. There's enough scripture out there to counteract that as a blanket statement that you can't look at something and, and biblically and honestly from a position of love and desire to help. Brother, if you see a brother, if you, if you see a brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. How can you see if he's overtaken in a fault if you don't judge? He said what he's doing is in a fault. There has to be a judgment made that what he's doing is wrong. That's not what the Bible's teaching in Matthew 7 1. It's erroneous to take it and mean it that way. Here Paul says, if you see a brother who walks disorderly, not after the traditions of what we've done, amen. Withdraw yourself from them. Wow! Well, that's not love. Paul said it. I don't know what to tell you. If you say you can say it's not love, oh no, we shouldn't do that. We should, you know, we just remember when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth when the man was shacking up with his stepmama. Yeah. Yeah. He said, "I've judged it already." He said, the, the, the Gentiles don't even get, engage in this kind of sin. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm turning them over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's harsh. No, that, I know some people have a hard time with this. That was love, the love of God. It was better for him to be, go through the, 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 the mill grind, as it were, until he repented than to keep living that way and go to hell. He said, I'm turning him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, the path he was on was, was a path that could lead him to renunciation of, of, of the lordship of Jesus and eternal damnation to hell. So we've got to understand the love of God works in, in, in uh, humans. We determine something, we make up something, we make up, again, we make up a narrative, and then that's the way it is. Oh, the love of God, God, a loving God could not do such and such. Yeah, yeah. Well, number one, God doesn't, you know, uh, put cancer on you to, to get you to, you know, uh, go here or go there. But here, he was, he was turned over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. We get the idea, you know, here, here, let me say this. When you usually hear people about God putting something on them, when they come back behind that to teach you a lesson, and nobody knows what the lesson is they're trying to learn. Right. Everybody knew why this man was being turned over to Satan. Yeah. Go ahead. There wasn't any question about the lesson he needed to learn. He needed to get out of sin and get right with God and not go to hell. It wasn't that, well, whatever the Lord's trying to teach me, I, you know, I guess I'll get it someday or somehow, some way. That's how we, most of the time the church approaches suffering. I, you know, the Lord knows best. No, when those things happened in the Bible, they knew what it was. The judgment that came for sin, and it came for sin. People who were living right didn't get judged. You know, you know how some guys sit down, I ain't got a clue why I've got, you know, cancer, but the Lord, the Lord knows what he's doing. So that's where we get into trouble. But in this case... Or these cases, you got a brother acting disorderly, not according to the commandments or traditions that they had been taught. Amen. They're walking disorderly. I mean, he just said walking disorderly. Not after the tradition which you received of us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. 
For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to you. Not because we have not the power to make ourselves an example for you, uh, for you to follow us. For even when we were with you, we, this we commanded you that, here's another commandment, <clears throat> that if a man would not work, he shouldn't eat. For we hear that there are some that walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Remember we talked about Sunday how that, um, you know, people don't have time to go out and do things if they're busy. Yeah, yeah. Amen? You know, you watch some of these stupid television shows and, you got women, the housewives or wherever, sleeping around with all the neighborhood men. And, and the thing is, if everybody was busy doing work, they wouldn't have time for all that mess. I know some people who don't have, have that kind of lifestyle go, how in the world do they have time for that? I barely get, I barely get up in the morning, get everything done, and get supper cooked and get back in bed. They're, they're, they're idle. They're busy about it. They're not walking orderly. They got, they got too much time on their hands to do things to the, just to sit around and dream up fleshly things. Amen. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat with their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. Now the Greek could be read this way. Um, if anybody, any man obey not our word, signify that man by an epistle. In other words, write us and let us know. Okay? They don't obey our word, let us know. Okay? And have, this is, we, we have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Now, don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a, a brother. Now, we'll stop here. Here Paul says, if they're not walking the way they're supposed to walk, don't have company with them. See, how many have been taught that we just love people and no matter what they're doing, we just keep loving on them? No, he said we need to, they need to be put to shame. This isn't harsh. Well, maybe it is harsh, but it's not harsh for the purpose of being harsh. Right. The purpose is to, for them to wake up and realize that if I'm going to walk with God and walk in the family of the kingdom of God, I, so we get all these stupid things. People come up with stuff, and they get, somebody got hurt in the church, or somebody did them wrong, or whatever, and they, they run off, and they talk about how they get more love outside the church than they do in the church. Yeah. Now, that drinking buddy wants to take you to hell with him. He don't care about your eternal soul. He doesn't care if you go to hell or not. He just, you know, as a matter of fact, you're just there to help him make, feel better about what he's doing. Hello? But we call it love. It's not love if we just, if we tell them, you know, I can't, listen, you're going to walk this way. I can't hang out with you. That's not love. No, it's the commandment of Paul to the church. Yeah. I know people don't like to hear this, but it's still Bible. If they're not going to walk in, in, in accordance with the scripture and walk the way they're supposed to walk, the Bible says that don't count them as an enemy. Admonish him as a brother. It means, you know, hey, tell him, hey, look, this is wrong. You're not living right. I can't hang out with you and you're smoking dope. Hello? Marijuana don't, uh, we, we, we don't have to get into, we have to get the statistics on marijuana. Because it's now it's getting legal and people's pumping it and there's nothing wrong with smoking weed. If the Bible doesn't say anything about it because it's the herb of the field. There's, there's the, the health risks of marijuana are, are horrible. Long-term use lowers your IQ permanently. Destroys brain cells. Makes you stupid, in other words. And you, don't you think that a socialistic-minded group of people who want to control the, the populace don't want everybody smoking dope so they become stupid? They want everybody sitting around smoking. Listen, back under the Soviet Union, everybody just drank vodka all the time. There was plenty of vodka. Vodka was cheap. A lot, of the, a lot of the vodka made back then was made with potatoes. It was made from potato alcohol. Grow a lot of potatoes, get everybody drunk, keep them inebriated, and they'll just go to work and be their little sheeple going to the factories all the time when they're the communist thing. The whole marijuana thing is to get everybody dumbed down stupid, destroy their brain cells so they can, well, man, they're going to start killing people at 70. Cool. Because they're high. Anyway. 
But if we're in the church, if we're in the church, and you're not walking upright, you're not walking the way you should walk, it's not that you're not loved. The Bible says don't count them as enemies. In other words, Paul's, Paul's buffering or, or tempering not walking with them, with, but don't count them as an enemy now. He's not your enemy. Don't treat him as an enemy, but you can't walk with him. You admonish him, say, you know, I love you, but I can't walk with you in this. We can't hang out and you're smoking dope and, and whatever else, drinking and getting high and, I mean, whatever else you're doing. I can't hang out with you. I love you. And what you're doing is wrong. Oh, that's judgmental. That's not judgmental. He just said admonish him as a brother when they're walking disorderly. It means if you're admonishing them as a brother when they're walking disorderly, it is you're addressing how they're walking. See, we, we, we move away from this in the church. And let me say something, guys. A lot of times people who, want to, who travel and stuff don't pastor. And they don't have to come in and live with the people. Yeah. They can just come in and come, they'll, they'll say about evangelists. They, they, they come in, they blow up, they blow, they blow in, blow up, and blow out. All right? They blow in, they blow up, and they blow out. And listen, I'm, not, I'm not against the other guests. We, we need them. But you, you, pastors have to deal with this kind of stuff, and they don't. And say, oh, I want to go hear Brother So-and-so. He don't ever talk about that. Sure he don't. That's not his pastor. That's, he's not a pastor. It's not his calling. But the pastors have to. And so if you're not walking right, the Bible says don't have company with them. Right. Admonish them. It's love to go to them and say, you know what? I love you, but this is wrong. Oh, you're judging me. No. I'm following the Bible. Hello. I said, I'm following the Bible. What's judgment? Woman caught in adultery in the very act. That's the hypocritical type judgment. Hello. It's a government that convicts the populace for insider trading and exempts themselves from insider trading. Did y'all know that? The Congress is, is exempt from any insider trading laws. If you do the same thing, you go to jail. That's, and so for them to judge you on doing that is a false or hypocritical judgment. Because they've exempted themselves from the penalty of it. A woman caught in adultery. Uh, it probably was a normal practice for the guys to get them uh, some sweetheart on the side. Hello? And then go tell everybody else, you can't come into the temple. You're a sinner. You're a prostitute. You're a harlot, you know. Oh, we're going to penalize her. But she was, have anybody ever really sat and thought about, we caught her in the act. Where was the man? If they caught her in the act, there was somebody else there. But she was the harlot. He was probably an esteemed person of society or even part of the Sanhedrin. He may have been a Pharisee or a Sadducee. He got let go. She got brought to be penalized. So that's when Jesus began to write on the ground, and, you know, and, and they all left one by one. One where the accusers, there are none that neither do I, do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. See? We, we get the wrong ideas about things. So in the church, Paul says, if we've got people not walk, who are walking disorderly, not after the commands we've given or traditions we've given. Have no company with him. Or withdraw, he says, he says here, withdraw thyself from them. At least how it says it. Have no company with him here. Okay. So withdraw over another place. He says, have no company with him that he may be. There's a purpose in it. There is a reason for it. It's to bring him to shame so that he doesn't think it's okay to continue doing However, he's walking disorderly. Why? Don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Why? To bring him to repentance. Now you've got people teaching, we don't need repentance anymore. First John 1, 9 doesn't belong to the church. You know? We just look at the finished work of Jesus. Here Paul saying, do something that will bring a saint in. Why? Godly sorrow worketh Repentance. Why does God want us to repent? So we get all that junk out of us, and our heart won't condemn us. 
We, and, and if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. But we don't hear this. Oh, we, ah, we just walk in love. This is love. Spank my children when they were younger because I loved them. Oh, you're beating your child. You hit your child, teach them hit. Well, the Bible says if I, if I spare the rod, I hate my child. That the rod of correction will drive rebellion far from the heart of the child. That's what it says. People come along now and say, spanking your child, corporal punishment. That's so mean. No, it's love. I'm not talking about abuse. But I know a lot of boys back in the old days that when they got 18, 19 and thought they were going to stand up and be the stallion against dad, they just beat them up. Yeah. Brother Summerall, I heard him tell this story. When, I forget if it was, if it was Stephen or the other son, about 35 or so, had been out in, in, on the mission field in the Philippines, had come home. And, and stay in the house, they were staying with them, stay in the house a few days or whatever. And Sister Summerall came in and his room was messy. She said, clean your room up. He said, Mom, I'm, I'm a grown man, I don't have to clean my room up. She said, I said, clean your room up. He said, no. She said, well, I'll just wait till your daddy gets home. Yeah. Brother Summerall walks in, walks up and KOs him. Jumps on him and beats him up with his fist. He says, now get up and clean your room. I like it. I like, you know, it's teaching them a lesson of respect of authority. You, don't, you, ever, you ever lose the revelation of that lesson, and you'll lose that with God. Yeah. It's important. But admonish him as a brother. Now the peace, Lord of peace, himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Hallelujah. And so Paul writes a letter dealing with some very, very strong things here. The, 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 the falling away of the church, the return of Jesus and the judgment, uh, how you deal with errant brethren in the church. Um, those, there's a lot he's dealing with here. Again, reestablishing, telling them not to, to, to become uh, wearied or, or waver or faint and, and fall away. We'll, you keep 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 your your zeal hot for God. Yeah. Amen. Guard yourself. There are people coming. There's a spirit coming. This this going to try to deceive you. And there's going to be a falling away. Guard yourself. Everybody say Amen. We have to guard ourselves. We cannot afford. Can it happen, Pastor? <clears throat> Until recently, I, could, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that I've actually seen it. I've seen it happen. I've seen people, someone fall completely away from I mean, talking about born again, spirit filled, tongue talking, prophesying, Bible reading. I mean, committed, sold out for Jesus, lunatic. Renounce God, renounce Jesus. Mock the blood of Jesus. In, 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 in the most despicable terms as a believer you could see for somebody who once had been washed in that blood. How did that happen? It started, one thing I can tell you, if I go back and trace it, I can tell you it started with a rebellion against the leadership. I'm not, I'm not trying to get y'all freaked out, but that's where it started. It started with a, you know, um, I like my pastor, but you know, the associate pastor, I like better. He's really good. It started way back then. Then it got over into other areas, got over into, um, you know, they knew more about family, you know. There's all kinds of stuff. And it, just, it took years. It took years. Folks, these things don't happen overnight. You don't wake up one day. You're not going to be in church falling out in the spirit today and wake up tomorrow morning and go, I renounce Jesus. It don't happen that way. Amen? It just doesn't happen that way. You don't wake up one day and say, I'm tired of serving God. 
So Paul's, there's, a, there's warnings in his writings that are not warnings of control or hatred or, you know, domination. They are warnings for the safety and preservation of their salvation that they continue to walk uprightly before the Lord. God loves people, you know. Amen. So I, I think we're somewhere around Acts chapter 16 now. Uh, or so, and I, I have to go back now and, and, and get back in my notes, find out where we were. Um, Acts 16. No, we, I think we got over to eight, eight, maybe 18. Yep, 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 yep. We got to Acts, actually Acts chapter 19. There's only you know, 10 more chapters. And this is the things we're going to, have to co- we'll be covering things after, after we get out of Acts. We'll be covering historically where Paul was when he wrote different letters as we go through the letters and stuff. Uh, when, you know, the prison epistles, the post-prison epistles, first prison epistles. Um, you know, Paul's in prison, in prison at least twice. Um, been to, and I want to get those, those pictures of, of where they believe Paul and Peter both were held captive in Rome I've been there, and it's a, um, it's, you wouldn't want to be there. You just want to, that wouldn't be, you know, they let you down. Your door was, your, your crate, the gray, grid was up top. They let you down into your cell. You, you want, you want no prison breaks, okay? Your, your, your food was dropped down with rope, and your toilet bucket was taken up with rope and that kind of stuff. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant experience. But Paul and Peter both, you know, went there and, you know, for the gospel. So we'll get to the prison epistles and post-prison epistles and all that kind of stuff. All right? Do you all enjoy the first and second Thessalonians? <laughs> Thessalonians? <laughs> Talking about getting tongue-tied. Enjoy, you all enjoy that? I know some of this is not always going to be shouting. Because it's, it's, it's more fun to shout and go, go, go get five scriptures on how you're going to get rich next week and, t- and everybody just running. It's okay when we're doing a systematic teaching. We're doing, we're doing a chronological, ex, ex, you know, and, and doing expository and following this kind of line uh, to help us. Because I'm going to tell you, if you understand this from an from a, a, a expositorial, as I said, or exegetical position, and we're doing, somebody's doing systematic, and it gets out of line, you're going, well, wait a second. Now, now Paul did, yeah, I, I understand the scriptures, but you've got to keep them in balance. You, you start, you'll understand. He said this too. When he said so many things, he was, it, was, it was surrounded by this. A lot of times we'll just pull out that out and leave all the other stuff behind. And we don't want to hear the other stuff. But that's all part of growing. Paul didn't write a letter on faith. Does that make sense? He wrote letters, and there was faith in them. There are scriptures on faith in them. There are scriptures on faith throughout the Bible, but they weren't written just as a letter on faith. Again, I'm not against that. As a matter of fact, I, st- I teach that way. And we'll probably be teaching on faith sometime in the next couple of months. And we'll go get the scriptures and we'll teach how faith works, da-da-da-da-da. I get that. I'm, I'm, but on the other hand, by, by building an understanding of, the, of how the letters are written and all that Paul said, then we set some parameters around so that we don't get into excesses. We don't get into excess with love. Amen. And start acting goofy. You ever see anybody act goofy over love? It's, you know, I call, it, I call it sloppy agape. Because it, it is, they're getting goofy with it. They're not staying within the, the, the rest of the whole word of God, the whole counsel. 